to start off this beautiful preparation for our Mother of Sorrows, which this Friday will be the parish's patroness feast. It's very good that we prepare ourselves for this. And I would like to kind of break our ideas in three principal points. Today we're going to look at the introduction to Our Lady of Sorrows, so therefore the doctrine about her sorrowful heart and her seven dollars. And then the next day we're going to look at the first half of those dolors, those sorrows of Our Lady. And then on the Friday, we're going to look at the rest of the, the sorrows of Our Lady. And there are two principal ideas that I would like to share with you now so that it will set the tone for everything that we will reflect on for the next couple of days, these days. The first principle is taken from an encyclical of Pope Pius XI in 1928, an encyclical called Miserentissimus Redemptor. In that encyclical, the Holy Father made a reflection about a theological principle, which is that of the hypostatic union, the divine nature and human nature of Christ united to his divine person. And therefore, everything that he does in his humanity embraces all times because of the force of his divine nature and united to his divine person. So therefore, he says that even though our Lord is risen in heaven right now at this moment in glory and has perfect bliss and is the cause of all bliss, in some mysterious way, mystical way, the Christian can in this moment, 2,000 years later, go back in time, so to speak, and place consolations into the heart of Jesus. Isn't that a remarkable idea? That what we do right now in my spiritual life, my, my prayers, my sacrifices, I can alleviate my divine Savior from some of those sufferings that he endured for my salvation. I can give him a consolation. That's the first principle I would like you to realize and think about in your mind. The second one is from a vision of a certain blessed, by the name of Blessed Veronica Binasco. And she was beatified back in 1517 by Pope Leo X. And it was Pope Clement that extended this, uh, this blessedness to the entire church in 1672. It's important because she received a vision where our Lord communicated to her the following message. And it's quoted by St. Alphonsus Liguori, by which I would, by the way, I would take most of my reflections from in these next three days. It's a very interesting idea, and I would like to carefully state it so we will not forget it. What our Lord told this blessed Veronica. He said, I have more pleasure when you attempt to console my mother's sorrowful heart than if you were to try to console me directly to my afflicted heart. Let that sink in. So therefore, look, look back at that first principle that we just mentioned, that the the Roman pontiff said that we can go back 2,000 years and console the heart of Christ. Well, Christ is saying, if you really want to console me, if you want to put joy in my heart, if you want to alleviate me in my sufferings, console my mother. He loves his mother so much, and it caused a lot of his agony and passion, even to the point of his death, it precipitated his death, seeing his mother so sorrowful on the cross. Who would ever want to see one's mother in that state of suffering and grief? It's 
So those are the two ideas. Take well in your heart. Write them down in your heart. Because it will set the tone for the rest of what we're just about to adventure, to learn, and to reflect together. You know, some people say, why do we have this sorrowful mother in the center of this church? Why isn't she off on the side? Well, she has to be right in the center because, first of all, it's millennium tradition of our Catholic churches that we place the patroness of the parish in the center. And why is that? Not because we put them above God nor above Christ, but Christ is the true center of the church in the Holy Eucharist in the Blessed Sacrament. As you see, our Lord's Sacred Heart is there and that iron crucifix is His arms raised up. And what is He holding in His arms? The greatest work of His creation, His mother's sorrowful mother, as He's hoisting her up and saying, see the works of Almighty God through her. As St. Louis de Montfort says, we say Mary, and she says God. And so we don't want to just throw Our Lady over to the side. We want to put her right by her son in the position of this chapel and this church. And our Lord is beaming with joy as, he ha- as He's holding up Our Lady 24-7, year after year in this church, beaming with joy. He doesn't want Our Lady to be over to the side. He won't be as consoled in that way. He wants Our Lady close to His heart. And what a blessed parish. Many parishes would have in that middle, with all due respect, Saint Henrietta. You know, there she is. (laughs) St. Henrietta. Okay, so our Lord's lifting up a great work of St. Henrietta. and Okay. But how about the Blessed Virgin? But in her tremendous sorrows. It's one of the greatest, one of the greatest blessings for a parish. Believe me. And we're going to find out why in these next hours. Today, tomorrow, Friday in preparation for our feasts. The title of this meditation, or this conference, this sermon, will be that Queen of Martyrs. The Blessed Virgin is a true martyr in a very true sense of the word. And not only is she a true martyr, but she is the queen of all martyrs. St. Basil the Great says, As the sun surpasses all the stars in luster, so the sorrows of Mary surpass all the tortures of all the martyrs combined. And St. Albert the Great He says, as we are under the great obligations to to Jesus for his passion he endured for our love, so also we are under great obligations to Mary for the martyrdom which she voluntarily, voluntarily suffered for our salvation in the death of her son. End of quote. Our first point is that Our Lady presented in the, in the 14th century to a mystic by the name of St. Bridget of Sweden, communicated to her seven promises to those who are devoted to the seven dolors of her sorrowful heart. Those who say at least, at least seven Hail Marys in honor of the seven uh, sorrows. I will grant peace to their families. That's a good start. 
They will be enlightened about the divine mysteries. I will console them in their pains and I will accompany them in their work. I will give them as much as they ask for as long as it does not oppose the adorable will of my divine son or the sanctification of their souls. And this is the big one. I will defend them in their spiritual battles with the infernal enemy and will protect them at every instant of their lives. And believe me, as the diabolicals on arise, as the witches and wizards are all about our streets right now in great numbers than ever before in Christendom history, this will be a very, very useful promise to have pronounced upon us our souls, our families. I will visibly help them at the moment of their death. They will see the face of their mother. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I just want to be frank with you. I remember as a, as a high school kid, that was one of the things that pushed me into the seminary was I want to see the face of Mary one day, so I want to do good things for her. <laughs> So that was like one of my big motivations of entering the, the seminary. I want to see Mary. I want to see that beautiful face one day. Could you imagine dying, when you, you know, taking breaths on your uh, oxygen tank and all of a sudden seeing the Blessed Virgin right in front of your face? <laughs> it's almost like I get excited for that. I would like to see that, you know? Yeah. And then the last promise from heaven from Our Lady. I have obtained this grace from my divine Son that those who propagate this devotion to my tears and dolors will be taken directly from this earthly life to eternal happiness. Since all their sins will be forgiven and my Son will be their eternal consolation and joy. In other words, you will not have one second in purgatory. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? This very strong promise from Our Lady. And then in addition to this, St. Alphonsus Liguori enumerates four more promises from heaven. And this is found in the Glories of Mary on page 406 in the English edition. It's revealed to St. Elizabeth. I don't know which Elizabeth he's referring to. Maybe of Hungary, I'm not sure. But he says, It was revealed to St. Elizabeth that St. John the Evangelist sought to see Our Lady after her assumption into heaven, and therefore Jesus and Mary appeared. And at the request of Our Lady, our Lord promised four principal graces those devoted to her sorrows, that those who before death invoke the Divine Mother in the name of her sorrows, will obtain true repentance of all their sins. That he will protect all who have this devotion in their tribulations and will protect them, especially the hour of death. That he will impress on their minds the remembrance of his passion. That he will place such devotion Oh, no, he should place, he will place such devout servants in Mary's hands to do with them as she wishes and to obtain for them all the graces that she desires. <laughs> Let that one run wild on me, please. That's a great one. That's a great one. Whatever the queen would like to swoon and think, you know, swoon and think. May my son be this, and may he be that, and may he. Yes, yes, I will keep on, keep on wishing, and desiring, and saying, please. But we have to be devoted to her sorrows first. It's not a gimme. It's not a joke. We're going to talk about true devotion to her sorrows in our talks. Just very briefly, for sorrow, the prophecy of Simeon, the sword of sorrow, trans, 
transpass her heart. The second sorrow, the flight into Egypt. The third sorrow, child loss in the temple. Fourth sorrow, Mary meets Jesus carrying the cross. The fifth sorrow, Mary at the foot of the cross. The sixth sorrow, the thrusting the lance in the heart of Christ. And Mary receives the body of her son, Jesus. And the seventh sorrow, Mary at the burial of her son. Now let's get into the nuts and the bolts of this great devotion. And like I say, tomorrow we're going to look at the sorrows themselves. But today let's get to the introduction, which is very important. All important. Saint Bernard of Clavaux says, Anima magis est ubi amat quam ubi animat. That is to say, listen to this, the soul is more where it loves than where it lives. It's another way of saying Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where thy treasure is, there is thy heart also. Where our treasures is, that's where we are. That's where we are. So if Mary then, through love, lived more in her son than in herself, a much greater grief did she suffer at the death of her son than if the cruelest death in the world had been inflicted upon her. And that's the key word. Underline it a thousand times. Love. The love of the Blessed Virgin. That's why we have no devotion to her sorrowful heart is because we don't understand her love. Because we're sinners. So our love is diminished. But can you imagine a sinless heart? How it loves? We have no idea. And that's why we got to have a sermon about it so we can get an idea of this love of the Blessed Virgin. We have to understand it in order to appreciate it, in order to commit ourselves to her sorrows, is to understand her love. Mary suffered more than all the martyrs combined. Martyrs suffered for Christ, but many times their love For Jesus rendered their pains sweet. Not all of martyrs, but many martyrs had their pains sweetened, bearable, and even at times, get this, delightful. We are told by St. Augustine that St. Vincent the martyr suffered the rack torn with hooks burnt with red-hot iron plates. But he says of this martyr, St. Augustine says, alius videbatur pati alias loqui. One seemed to suffer and another to speak. In other words, he says, I think it's like two people here. One who's suffering and the other one that's just chirping like a bird, happy as a bird. How's this possible? says the great Bishop of Hippo. Or St. Boniface suffered too in his body by being torn with irons, sharp reeds wedged in between his fingernails and flesh. Melted lead was poured down his esophagus. That's, That's not very feeling good. Yet, through it all, he was heard to exclaim, Gracias tibi ago, Domine Jesu Christe. I give thee thanks, O Lord Jesus Christ. Such serenity and peace. 
a certain St. Mark and St. Marcellinus were being pierced with nails in their feet. And the tyrant appealed to them saying, miserable wretches, see your condition and save yourselves. And they replied saying, what torments do you refer to? We are feasting with joy now for when we suffer for Jesus, we rejoice. (laughs) And referring to St. Lawrence, of Rome, who died on a gridiron, St. Leo the Great said, the flames of love were more powerful to cheer his soul than the exterior flames were to torture his body. And thus St. Lawrence told the tyrant roasting him, if you wish to feed on my flesh, a part sufficiently is cooked, turn and eat. (laughs) Half joking there with a little smile on his face. I can see it now. That's the martyrs. Many of them. Not all of them had that, but many of them did. Many of them did. These martyrs and many others, says says St. Augustine, were able to suffer joyfully because intoxicated with the divine wine of divine love they felt neither torments nor death and listen it is not so for Jesus and Mary not so we have to let that sink into our minds and hearts everything we just spoke about the martyrs did not come even close to the Blessed Virgin and to Christ our Lord. In Mark chapter 14, verse 33, we read in scriptures there about the Garden of Gethsemane. Cepit pavere et tadiri. He began to fear and to be heavy. How did he feel? All those 33 years, he showed determination to give himself up for our sins. He was looking forward. I have a baptism to receive and how I am restless until it happens, he says. He was chomping at the bit. To perform the work of our salvation. Isaiah 53, 7. He was offered because he willed it. He willed it. He wanted it. Desired it. There is no doubt that throughout his life he longed for the hour of his passion. It was why he came on earth. He even said only a few hours earlier from the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke twenty two fifteen, with desire, I have desired to eat this pasch with you, burning with desires, as if it was already upon me. Now, fear? Why? Why fear? John twelve twenty seven. Now is my soul troubled. He said this in the past couple of days before Gethsemane. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came unto this hour. But once there, get this, his prayer quickly changed to this. My father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Why this apparent flip-flop? Saint Bede the Venerable says in his commentary on this verse of Scripture, Mark 14. He says that Jesus prayed 
that the father take this chalice away, not so much that he didn't want to drink it, but to prove he was man. And St. Alphonsus de Gori adds, not in view of being heard, but to give us to understand that he died as man and afflicted with great fear of death and the sufferings which should accompany his death. In other words, let me put this in plain English. An exchange. Did you hear me? An exchange. His infinite God-like courage giving it to you and me. And he takes our fears. That's how the martyrs went to their deaths. Many of them. Holy exchange. Christ got the bad deal on that one. (laughs) And we got the best deal. We receive from him his courage. Sacrament of confirmation. And confession. Holy communion. We receive his very courage of the God-man. So he extended us his heavenly courage and he absorbed our darkest fears. If you look at that word padre, in Spanish they even have a a similar word, pavor. It's almost like it's a it's a fright. It's a it's an absolute terrorizing fright of someone like plunging into the ocean in an airplane. <laughs> that type of fear, like you're plunging into the into the into the ocean uh, from thirty thousand feet above, plunging. That's not just a. That's not like a half little afraidness, you know. That's not. We're talking about like on steroids fear like where you lose your mind pavere pavere didn't say temore it said pavere chepi pavere and then also chepi tedere He began to be heavy, heavy. He felt a great weariness that came upon him in view of the torments that our sins will cause him. That was the source of his heaviness and fear. Our sins. When one feels great weariness, even pleasures are painful. All the thoughts of torment rushed upon his blessed soul. My sins, the sins that you've committed, the sins of the whole world of all ages, and also the physical pains by which those sins will come to him, will cause him, quickly came upon the short remainder of his life. Passing before his eyes were the insults, the blows, the Roman spittle, the abandonment of all men and even of God as it is humanly felt, all came thrashing upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So much so, we said this in missions when I came back here and and Lent, if you remember, even developed an infirmity called hematidrosis. Capillaries bursted and he started to sweat blood. And Jesus, as we said, is the cause of all bliss of heaven, said, Anima meas triste usquet mortem. My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Mark 14, 34. And so therefore this brings us to our theme of our latest sorrows. Don't worry, I didn't figure about her yet, huh? Just setting up the the doctrinal point by talking about Christ first. 
St. Louis de Montfort taught, get this, it's easier to separate fire and heat from the solar sun than it is to separate Mary from Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute, that phrase. My luck, I try, you know, the first 15, you know, paces up toward the sun, I'll get burnt off, you know, some, some Star Wars will knock me out of the skies before I get to the sun, much less get into the sun. Let us look at the case of the Blessed Virgin. So we established that for Jesus, the cause of his suffering and death wasn't so much from the nails and the blades and the cords and whatever other physical device, but more directly the weight of our sins. And for this, he endured his martyrdom and utter pain and suffering for love of us. For this very son who suffered for our sins was the whole cause of Mary's grief. The love she bore Jesus, that's what caused her death on Calvary in a spiritual way. So the love that she bore him was her only and too cruel executioner. That was the only thing. The whole martyrdom consisted in seeing and pitying Christ, weighed down by our sins. Other martyrs had to deal with hooks and knives and cords and guillotines and all the rest of the devices. The martyrs are thus represented with their devices of torture, For example, St. Paul, you always see him depict with a sword. St. Andrew with his X cross. St. Lawrence with his gridiron. But the Blessed Virgin Mary is represented with her dead son in her arms. That's what killed her. That's what did it. The Pietà. For St. Bernard says, with the other martyrs, their great love soothed the anguish of their martyrdom. But the more the Blessed Virgin loved, so much she suffered and so much more cruel was her martyrdom. End of quote. How is that? It's this simple. Christ our Lord, crucified for the sole purpose for her immense and cruel pains and torments. So here, let me give you just very quickly, because I don't want to get into this theological thought, but the Blessed Virgin is mediatrix, and do I dare say it, because it's very controversial today, (laughs) co-redentrix. Okay, but we have to say it. So, So in other words, Our Lady is participating in Mark 14, 33, that we just examined. In a certain way, also occurred to the Blessed Virgin what occurred to Jesus in Mark 14, 33. So in other words, all that Christ merited for us on the cross and all his sufferings and passion and death and strict justice, Mary merited for us by congruous merit based on the charity that united her to God. Now, Christ alone as head of the human race could strictly merit condignly to transmit divine life to us. But as that great Pope that occupied the throne of Peter, since Peter himself, as Padre Pio says, St. Pius X said the following, Mary, united to Christ in the work of salvation, merited de congruo for us, what Christ merited for us, de condigno. Encyclical Ad Diem Illum, February 2nd, 1904. So in other words, 
congruous, decongruous, and de condignly. So what it means is that all of the salvation and all this, the redemptive suffering is all has its spark and its power, everything all in Christ himself alone as a God-man. He's meriting salvation for us 100%. But then in a remarkable way, Our Lady is kind of like grafting herself into that only merits of Christ, salvific merits. And by her own participation in that, she's from, from that sap, from that lifeline of Christ's infinite merits, Our Lady's own merits become alive in it and assists in a marvelous way. Christ's merits. What a beautiful idea. Nowhere in scriptures is it narrated that Mary was bruised by cudgels or grabbed by pincers or hammered with clubs. But yet she is the queen of all martyrs. St. Bonaventure dares to say that these wounds that were scattered all over the body of Jesus were all united in the heart of Mary. They're all united in her heart. Every single wound and every single pain of Christ. St. Thomas Aquinas says that the dignity of the motherhood of Mary borderlines the infinite. She's a creature, so that's, we can't say infinite, infinite in the way we say with God but she borderlines the infinite. In Thomistic philosophy, we study that agere sequitur esse, which means it follows that what a thing acts according to its nature. So therefore, fish breathe underneath water, a bird flies, a man thinks intelligently, and so on and so forth. Everything in nature works according to what its nature is. So therefore, with the Blessed Virgin, since her nation, nature borderlines the infinite, as St. Louis de Montfort says, what belongs to God by nature belongs to Mary by grace. It follows that, get this, her love for Christ borderlines the infinite. And the more she loved her sorrowful son during those last 18 hours of his life, the more the sorrows were devastating beyond the most horrendous martyrdom known to any of the saints until Judgment Day. Who can measure the love of Mary for Christ her son? Blessed Amadeus said that there were two loves she bore for her son. She had two types of love for her son. And these two were inseparable. The first one was a supernatural love for her son. In other words, loving him as God. And then secondly, she had a natural love for her son as a mother for her son. Loving him as her son. And these two loves were so united that it only formed one single love for him. So she loved Jesus, says Blessed Amadeus, to such a degree that it was impossible for a creature to love him more. There was no creature ever possible to love that Christ more than the wish he loved him, especially in those last 18 hours of his life. St. Albert the Great commented on this idea. Ubi sumus amor, ibi sumus dolor. Where love is greatest, there grief is greatest. Our conclusion. Jeremiah, the prophet, prophesies about Mary's agony at the cross of Jesus. Lamentations chapter 1, verse 12. 
where the prophet Jeremiah says, O all ye that pass by the way, attend and see if there be any sorrow like to my sorrow. I just want to let you know, when I was saying Mass here this morning, that's a beautiful image of Our Lady. Too bad you can't get up too close so often, but those eyes of that, that statue right there tells it all. The sorrows of the Blessed Virgin depict so well in that image of Our Lady. Our Blessed Mother is telling us through the prophet Jeremiah, all you who pass by this church, attend and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. One of the greatest things or the most surprising things about Our Lady of Fatima only 106 years ago, Sister Lucia said that Our Lady never smiled a single time. And she had a very grave face, very grave. Our Lady is always participating in that divine mystery of our Lord's Christ's suffering in the mystical body. Now here's a very powerful quote from St. Bonaventure, that co-founder of the Franciscan order. This will keep our devotion alive to Our Lady of Sorrows. Oh, Lady says the great St. Bonaventure. Why hast thou wished to go and sacrifice thyself also on Calvary? He asks. Why? Was not a crucified God sufficient to redeem us? That thou, his mother, would be crucified too? Indeed, the death of Jesus, listen to this, this is the doctor of the church saying this, Indeed, the death of Jesus was more than enough to save the whole world. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, one drop of the precious blood of Christ could save the whole world over various times. And also an infinity of worlds, he says, not just saving our world, but save an infinity of worlds. But this good mother wished for the love she bore us likewise to aid the cause of our salvation with the merits of the sorrows which she offered for us on Calvary. Could you imagine that? I mean, just uh, try to imagine and try to understand even 10% of what was just quoted by St. Bonaventure. If you understood 10% of this quote, you will be devoted to the sorrowful mother until your, your dying day. Could you imagine the doctor having a miracle pill here or whatever? Says, okay, your little Susie who's dying of cancer, all I'd have to do is just give her this one pill and she will no longer have cancer and she'll be... Uh, healthy than ever before. But then the mother says, hold on, wait a minute. I says, what, we got the pill right here. Wait, let me go through a, let me go through a Calvary. Let me suffer. I know it's gonna work, but I wanna be part of the suffering. So, she, so the mother like, you know, goes through like some unnecessary Calvary of, torture and pain and martyrdom. And then after she gets her head chopped off, you know, she's holding the head in her hand, you know, and she's walking over. Okay, now you can give that little pill to her. I just died for her. You know what you and I would say? That woman would be absolutely insane. We'd have to take a pulse and go sit her down and say, look, look, darling, 
you're a little flighty there. But yet, that's what the blessed, she knew that her son had the power to save us with just a, a, a snap of a finger. And there she was, willingly, voluntarily, being crunched, polarized, beaten, beyond any capacity of all the martyrs combined and their internal and external sufferings out of pure love. Ah, my dear brothers and sisters, if only we can understand this. And I would just now, to conclude the conclusion, I quote again that blessed Veronica Binasco of which he said, so if we wish to console the heart of Jesus and repair his most sacred heart on those first Fridays and everything else that we do in our Lord, communions and all the rest of it, then we should attempt to repair and console his mother's heart. And our Lord will be more consoled than had it not been done. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.